back in the early 1970s, back in 1971, Ottawa opened, I guess, one of the first center observatories in all of Canada with a huge 16-inch telescope. Five years later, we had to relocate that observatory to the other side of Ottawa. It was originally south of Ottawa. We called it North Mountain Observatory, even though it seemed to be in the gully. And then we moved it out to Indian River Observatory into where we have it now, calling it Indian River Observatory. The lights are starting to actually, you know, which is the, it's the button. <laughs> which is about a 40 minute drive, 45 minute drive from Ottawa are starting to deteriorate again. Unfortunately, because of the cost of trying to relocate the observatory again and moving it further and further away from civilization and the result of reducing its usage, we figured we'd probably stand and try to reduce light pollution rather than moving to darker and darker skies. So Ottawa set up a light pollution abatement program and the Lights changing back there. Are you trying to change the light? Yeah. Yes. And you're probably pressing the wrong button. Uh, which button? Me. Button me. There's one button up here. <laughs> push it. Push it. <laughs> Look behind you. Your change your remote control. Holder down here. Here's the there's A and B, I'm not sure which is which. There we go. Ooh. Okay. And I guess we can focus out a little bit. I think focus too. Maybe on our Okay. This slide shows two versions of light pollution. And uh, both of them are really irritating, though they are really caused by completely different phenomena. One is sky goal that we can see in the background. That's actually on the center is Ottawa. And on the right hand side, sorry, on the left hand side is a little small hamlet, it's not a hamlet, a small town of 5,000 called Smith's Falls. If I turned around, I'd be seeing Kingston ruining about, I guess, two to three degrees of my southern horizon. So even, maybe it's Napanee, let's say it's Napanee. So the two different versions of light pollution here are the sky glow, which is caused by light that shines out horizontally from luminaires, scatters off aerosols and dust, and essentially gives a pole of light above us between us and the stars. The other ones are in the near field here, and those are the isolated lights, and they're essentially glare. Glare is more something that you're concerned about along the highway, but also light trespass, which is really no, that I know of, legal precedent to uh, to fight light trespass in Canada, I understand there is some in the states. These are the two types that Ottawa is finding we're having trouble with. At Indian River Observatory, there was one light and we solved that problem by putting a two foot by two foot piece of plywood on a hydro pole, but you can't do that very often now, especially when you use concrete poles. The com com combined effects of all this is we are. Here's Ottawa, and Ottawa is not a very large city. It's a, over a million, at least the metropolitan or the general area or greater area of Ottawa is over a million people. We are not that much better than East Toronto in terms of the extent that the lights shine out. And of course, we can't compete with Montreal, I'm afraid. But south of Ottawa, you'll notice all these little dots, and these are the little towns associated south of Ottawa with their bedroom communities. Some of them are towns in their own right with their own industry. But these are the places where our membership are moving their observatories or putting up observatories. And as a result of that, we had to fight or try to come up with a way of not just reducing the light of one city, but actually to reduce the light pollution of many cities all at once, which sounds like a horrific problem. And it is if you go about trying to just talk to individual people, say, at the, uh, individual citizens. The way that we decide to try to do it is to... Does it work? Doesn't work. Oh, okay. The, um, the way we decided to try to do it was because it's such a widespread problem, talking to individuals is a very... Uh, 
low density way of trying to uh, try to change or try to correct the problem. Instead, in Ottawa, we decided to talk directly with governments. Now, lighting is a very emotional issue, and we found that it would probably be better not to talk to the politicians through the press, but rather to talk to the politicians and the municipal engineers directly. This is a meeting we had with the Ministry of Transport of Ontario down in Toronto, and uh, we were rather surprised at, uh, uh, that we actually got an audience, and yet we're also surprised how little, in, how little, little we've heard of what of, uh, of their response to our presentation, but then we're also pleased to see the results of some of that. So it's rather a convoluted path as to know whether you were successful or not. Our Ottawa program then was to, to approach municipalities, approach uh, provincial governments, and also to approach other governments as well. In Ottawa, we have a multi-tier government system which makes it almost impossible to do anything because every government can then blame somebody else. We uh, have the National Capital Commission in Ottawa, which actually turned out to be quite a strong ally, as we'll hear in a few moments. One of the small towns, uh, Smith Falls, nearer to my own heart because my observatory is just outside Smith Falls. This is a typical street. It's actually very well lit if you want to write poems on, in the center of the street or so. It's, there's a lot of glare associated with these lights, but you can't really isolate one particular problem. It's more of a general problem. The lights that we have here are the standard Cobra lights, and the ones we have here are quite a different nature. The first the slide that I just showed previously are caused by a municipality. The lights here are caused by industry or business, in particular car dealers, as well as one low light courtesy of the Ministry of Transport of Ontario. The different, there's different colors of lights here. You see the metal halide for the car dealership lot. We have an old mercury vapor light, which is a hangover from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I suppose. And then the high pressure sodium, which are, are you, uh, which are the standard now that we have. You can talk to the Ministry of Transport, uh, Ministry of Transport of Ontario. And you'll do things about these lights. You'll talk to you can talk to the uh, municipality to deal with the other street lighting. But who do you talk to to handle this stuff? Because free enterprise being what it is, you want to change their life. Well, that's interrupting their ability to advertise. They consider it advertising. So the only way to handle this on a widespread uh, in a general way, is to actually do it through policy and bylaws, not to talk to one individual, one company after another. Otherwise, you'll have a full-time job for the rest of your life, and we don't want to do that. This is a standard Cobra, as we call it. They're actually far better now than they used to be. These, this particular light lets about two to two and a half percent of light shining up, but that kind of hides the problem. That what we're concerned with the sky glow is actually the horizontal light. That's what's scattering up and down, causing the whole sky to glow above us. There are variations of this theme, which are actually very, very good. Now, before we, some legislation was passed in Ottawa that limited the encroachment of lights upon dark areas, uh, what we call the green belts around Ottawa. And just before that was implemented, a politician in one city decided to put uh, a couple of miles or a couple of kilometers of lights up here. This is about one half million dollars. Put that up, and you see here we see, and so you have these ribbon of pearls stretch all the way from one community to another across a very dark area. But you'll notice that there's something different here, and this is where somebody either made a mistake or decided to give us a photo opportunity because these are a different type of cobra lights, and they're called flat glass cobra. And essentially, it's like a cobra on a severe diet. <laughs> and here we have essentially a flat glass. No light can shine above the horizon. In fact, no light really shines horizontally at all. Most of it is directed down below 10 degrees from the horizon. And it works quite well at reducing glare for drivers and, of course, keeping the light down on the ground. There's a high-tech version of this. You'll notice the reflector inside. The distribution of light is given by the reflector entirely. And it's called, uh, this particular one is a, a Rolls-Royce version. It's about three to four times the cost of the flat glass Cobra. But you can see it's got all kinds of segmented reflectors in there that do a really good job of distributing light underneath the lamp very, very well. Here's an example. Uh, Hunt Club Road in Ottawa. And here you see all these standard Cobras around here. You can easily see it. And lo and behold, what's going on up here? 
You don't see anything. And that's because the light is being directed down. Nothing shines horizontally. So all the light is going down onto the ground. And not only that, with this high-tech version, the Rolls-Royce version, you get a very uniform distribution of light on the ground. Well, we, before you can talk to the municipalities and governments, you really have to get your act together because you have to know as much as they do on the, in the subject or more. And you have to give a good spin that they will accept, a good spin on your presentation. That requires an awful lot of work, and that's where a lot of things fail because you have to put an awful lot of effort into something to get very much results. How do you change something like this? Just right along the highway, uh, south of Ottawa, Highway 16, into something like this, which is, granted, it's brain surgery lighting, but nothing goes up. Well, nothing goes up until winter. You can actually see this place from 10 kilometers away as a, as a pillar of light shining off the slow snow, a pillar of light going straight up. But they got the right idea. These lights going down, they, very nicely to they show their inventory, and they're not, well, they, they could be lower light levels, but at least they're getting all the light down on the ground. Be able to attract to approach industry, you have to do it by their pocketbook by making it very marketable, making trying to make it look like it's a very useful thing to do to attract uh, to attract uh, customers. And we seem to be rather successful in that because since the auto Light Pollution Committee started working and the program's been implemented. Shopping malls now typically all have sharp uh, flat glass luminaires like this at a much lower level, fortunately. So to get these dark skies that we all like to have, we have to put our effort into it. Either a few people do a Herculean effort or you have a lot of people doing a little bit which requires a Herculean effort of managing a lot of volunteers. So in auto we had sort of middle case we had a good number of people so that were easily managed. One of the things you have to do is get all the information together. That's good for about two months of work, gathering information, converting columns of numbers which are useless for politicians. Engineers love them, but useless for politicians and putting them in a nice graphical form that keep them awake and they can immediately see how sensible things are. And here just a picture uh, using a graphics package to put together some of the graphics that we use during our presentations to the municipalities. Some of the things you end up finding when you put this information together is that it's not cost effective to get the light down on the ground using flat glass covers or our other flat glass luminaires. It costs. And the reason for it is shown here, and this is a typical example that's used by many uh, municipal engineers in that this red line is what a standard cobra will do. This is, uh, sorry to describe this, this is where the luminaire is located right here and these are pole heights, minus one, minus two, or over positive being over the roadway than along the roadway. A standard cobra will throw the light out about three and a half pole spaces on either side of the pole. The flat glass ones only reach out at three pole spaces. However, this is where this is, if you call this one unit of light intensity, if you get over or uh, brightness on the ground, this is one tenth of it. So really out here, you're dealing up ten times, one tenth the intensity of the light under the pole, and really one could argue whether it's very much use at all. But what you do see is there's a much better light distribution around the pole, much broader light distribution illuminating the ground. This is the high-tech version. At uh, three times the price, you don't really gain too much, except it is more uniform. And that right under the pole, you have a much larger space of a uh, larger area of illuminated region. And that means the light is more uniform. This tells another aspect to why it is not economical. This is the light distribution for six pole heights. The red line is, again, the standard Cobra. And the blue line is a flat glass, or what's called a sharp cutoff, because the, the light is very well defined. Like the light footprint on the ground is very, very well defined. And you find in the middle, it can't be the standard cobra. It is very good at distributing light, at least in between the poles. But you have to tolerate much brighter light underneath the poles. What a flat glass does, or a sharp cutoff, is that it throw, takes the light from underneath the pole and it throws it into the center or, or away from the pole a little bit better. But still, the light level in mid-pole spacing is worse than the standard cobra. Now, the argument around this is that 
you can, it doesn't really matter that much because you don't have the glare associated with the standard Cobra. Unfortunately, in the uh, standards, there is no reference, or at least there's no link to the light levels of the glare, at least not in this context. So you're really, you've got a good idea, but nobody will listen to you because it isn't put in writing somewhere. This is where the cost gets very expensive. You can improve the low light level, the center uh, span illumination by moving the poles together from six pole heights to four pole heights. And this is where the municipalities always say it's gonna cost 30% more. And they're right. If you want to maintain the same light level in mid pole heights. But look what we've got here. You can deal with 20%, about 25% less light or lower wattage bulb. But the electricity in these things is minimal. They're extremely efficient lights and you won't win it on the cost of electricity grounds. You'll lose it on the fact that they have to put in uh, an extra pole in three or so at the price of about $3,000 capital cost. And that's an awful lot of money. So, you have to change the standards and incorporate all try to get policies that will encourage the, uh, what we want, and that is the light down on the ground. With all the noise we made in Ottawa, and the noise was made by, let me just uh, put a overhead up here. Here we are. Leave the slide on. This is Light Pollution Abatement Award. It's a model after the one from Calgary. And we just modified the, uh, the um, uh, citation a little bit in recognition of a responsible environment. He said, well, I'll just let that go. It's a very high-tech looking thing, very well reproduced by Don Fougere in Ottawa, and it's really classy. And people actually put this up on the wall, and it's awarded in public, that is, in, with cameras around, the news media around, so the politicians really want to look good, and they will provide the PR, really. They will make sure that it gets good coverage on primetime news. Instead of talking to literally tens of thousands of individuals, you can talk to one politician and reach 100,000, getting primetime news coverage. And we actually got about a minute of primetime news as they showed the virtues of uh, the lighting that we are trying to encourage. So we raised enough of a stink that we actually got invited, in fact, Terry Dickinson and I were invited to a City Lights Conference in Ottawa where the uh, Illumination Engineering Society of North America was represented. And what we ended up having at this conference was we actually had internationally renowned lighting architects that were very knowledgeable and were able to understand the concept of visibility over light levels. We had rather tough-nosed politicians that were very concerned about cost, and we also had extremely knowledgeable engineers. This is Gene, South, uh, Gene Smallwood of Rankin McCormick of Toronto, and a very, very well-known person in the lighting industry, having written some of the standards. That conference started with workshops. This is a, we were able to attract enough people from Ottawa to pretty well man every workshop. And the results of the workshops, by the way, this is uh, Steve Norris of our committee, Rick Wagner, president, uh, hence part of our committee, and Lee McDonald, also of our committee, during one of the, the <coughs> People got together, talked out, and it was amazing how many people wanted light, 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 and by the time the weekend ended, they wanted visibility, 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 which means uh, flat glass luminaires are sharp cut off, and uh, exactly what we want, the light down on the ground. When it was all put together, the results are sent back to the IES, for the new standards that are being written now. So we actually have some strategic impact on the lighting codes or the lighting standards for all of North America. So that'll handle the municipalities and the governments that are trying to put up the lights they, because they want to be able to hang their hat for legal reasons or liability reasons on something that somebody else said. And so that is good. It will be taking about five years to 30 years to implement because it, there's grandfather clause allowing existing lights to remain up. But as they fail, you'll be seeing, hopefully North America, more and more lights being put up that are flat glass. They won't handle these these particular ones here, which you find out in the countryside, you have to talk to them individually, but at least for the large 
roadways. Here we have some tall, high mass Hall of Fame lights. They look like salad bowls. They are a very good job of distributing the light and keeping it down. And from a distance, it's not the worst glare comes from the cars. So in Ottawa, we've been very successful at trying to stop the advance of light pollution. As population increases, so will light pollution, but at least we've checked its, its uh, increase. And hopefully, that will help everyone in Canada. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. Unfortunately, with four seconds to go, we have no time for questions.